Welcome to Parkview. I'm Nathan, one of the pastors around here, and I wanna give a special shout out to our Jacksonville, Florida, and our Surprise Arizona home campuses. Uh, we love you and are so grateful that you're helping us reach more people with the love of Jesus right in your own communities. Uh, we are a church that will do anything to help people find Jesus. So if you're watching because a friend invited you, maybe they shared this with you, and you're trying to figure out who Jesus is and what he means for your life, you belong here. We'll be together for about 30 minutes. First, our band will lead us with a song, and then Tim Harlow, our lead pastor, will kick off our new teaching series called Greatest of All Time. And by the way, I cannot wait for you to hear his message this week. And after Tim shares with us, um, I'll be back to walk you through some next steps, and then the band will close us out. Listen, the whole point of our time together is to help you discover the steps God might be asking you to take. And we would love to help you figure that out. So during the service or at any point this week, go to parkviewchurch.com slash next steps to start that conversation with us. And one last thing, before we get rolling, I just wanna say thanks to each one of you who has been so generous and committed to the mission God has called Parkview to. With your financial support, we've been able to build a church community online. And as a result, people are being reached all around the globe. And the thing is, I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. So thank you for being on mission with us. And if you'd like to support what God is building here, uh, listen, it's really easy. Just text Parkview Online to 77977 and follow the instructions on the screen. Uh, thanks for spending time with us today. After Pastor Tim's message, I'm going to share a cool opportunity specific for you, our online community. Uh, but for now, enjoy the service.
Hey Parkview, welcome to the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Not Michael Jordan, obviously not LeBron James who leaves before the game is over and wears 23 because he knows that MJ is the real GOAT, okay? I'm talking about the greatest scripture of all time. Next to John 3.16, I doubt that there is a passage of scripture that is more known and more comforting than the 23rd Psalm. You may hear it on a television program. Maybe somebody's going to read it to you in hopes of comforting you at some point. I read this passage of scripture at every committal service, at every cemetery I've ever been at, okay? There have been many times that I've been gathered around and we're going to lower somebody down in and I've been crowded under a tent with most non-church kind of mourners and I start reading this psalm and their lips start mouthing the words right along with me because this is the goat okay the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want Uh, really really PT I mean it's almost Christmas season what do you want for Christmas you know what I want for Christmas? I want 2021, right? Am I right? I mean, come on, New Year's Eve is gonna be the biggest party ever. Can't get worse, here comes the new year. But even with this dumpster fire that we call 2020, we still want. I mean, it's fall, right? The new iPhones are gonna be out soon. The new Apple Watch 6 is out that can measure your blood oxygen level. I didn't know I couldn't do without that. That's amazing. Why don't they make a watch that's sets off an alarm when you get too close to the refrigerator after eight o'clock. Why don't they make one that measures your alcohol level, right? Your blood alcohol level automatically makes it impossible to tweet and to call your ex and to drive. I mean, somebody should be writing these down. I've got the ideas I want, and it's okay to want. We want our candidate to win. We want the economy to survive. We want the pandemic to be over. You want your spouse and your kids to get out of your house and go back to school and work somewhere else. And they do too. Really want is not the right word here. Um, We're gonna use the King James because most people have already memorized it that way. But, But it's deeper than like, I want a new PlayStation, okay? It's about our desires and our needs. And here's the thing, many religions in their goals, their their, their faith goals are to teach people to deny their needs and their desires. And the, the Bible doesn't do that. The creation story reveals that man was created with desires and needs even when the world was perfect, even before sin came in. Do you understand that? We needed food. God didn't have to design us that way. We needed purpose. We needed relationship, right? What is, it is not good for man to be alone, but a need, okay? So here's what you need to understand. Paradise was not a place without wants or needs. It was a place where our wants or our needs are met in a relationship with God. Let me do that again. Paradise was not a place without wants or needs. It was a place where our wants and our needs are met in a relationship with God. Man, that explains Psalm 23 already, doesn't it? This is the difference between a believer and a non-believer. And whichever one you are today, we're great. We're, we're so glad that you're here with us. This is for you as well as us. I hope you'll grab a hold of this. But if you already do believe in Jesus, he said, why are you like the non-believers who are deeply concerned about these things? Your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs and he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Seek first the kingdom, right? That's what we're talking about. Interestingly, other religions aren't like this. I said that already, but Hinduism, the fourth and most advanced stage, requires a man to leave behind everything. When you get to this final stage, you leave behind everything with no possessions in your old age and you wander around until you die. Listen, if you find me doing that, please call the nursing home, okay? Notice Jesus doesn't say, hey, your heavenly father knows you don't really need those things. 
I mean, maybe he doesn't think you need a pulse oximeter on your watch, but the important stuff, he knows you need it and it's okay to want it. If you don't have a job right now, if you don't have food or clothes, if your family is in pandemic nightmare, if our country is divided and full of hatred, the difference between believers and non-believers is that we know who the shepherd is, okay? Jesus is saying, the key to your needs doesn't happen in pursuing your needs, but in pursuing God. The key to your needs doesn't happen as you pursue your needs. It happens when you pursue God. And this is where we must begin. The great lie, which goes all the way back to the beginning, is that God is in the way. He's blocking what we want right? Satan, Satan told Adam and Eve that lie and they bit, right? He even tried it on Jesus in the 40 days in the wilderness who told him to get lost. That was the difference. And he tempts you and I in the same way. And unfortunately, we're more of Adam and Eve than we are of Jesus. Actually, do you know what we are? We're sheep. Sheep are some of the dumbest animals on the planet. Okay, I need you to grab a hold of this. You probably heard this before and you just don't understand that this is an insult. How many of you have ever seen a Planet Earth show or an Animal Planet show about sheep? No. Here we are in the field with the sheep. We were going to look at interesting animals, but we couldn't find any. Oh, look at the sheep. Here we are. Notice them. They are standing. They have wool. Uh-oh, here comes a wild animal. But the sheep just stand there. They're so dumb. Run, sheep. Oh. We're going to have to edit that out. You've never seen that program, have you? Why? Because it's not, nobody wants to watch sheep. It's not a compliment to be called sheep. He, Jesus could have called us any other domesticated animal, okay? We could have been cows or chickens or pigs even, you know? But there is a reason he calls us sheep, and you need to understand it if you want to understand the shepherd. So I want to do this. Um, normally, I don't preach from the you know, King James. It was written over 400 years ago. It's Old English. The words aren't necessarily the same. But at a funeral, like I said, I do it this way because so many people have memorized it. And just in case a bunch of our people have done that, I want to do the same thing. So we're just going to stick to the King James on this. Here is what David wrote this. A shepherd boy who became the king of Israel... Here's what he had to say. Here's, who, here's what David had to say, um, who God called a man after my own heart. Only person in history he ever called that. Nobody knew God better than David. Let's read this together. Feel free to read it out loud with me wherever you're at right now. If you're at Starbucks, read it really loud. It'll be fun because you might hear somebody else over there that's also watching it. Are you ready? Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And probably some of you are sitting by somebody that you're actually a little surprised they kind of knew most of that one, aren't you? Yeah. Here's the problem. Dallas Willard said it this way. Unfortunately, the Lord is my shepherd is a sentiment that's carved on tombstones more often than it is a reality written into lives. And I would agree with that. And I'm going to tell you, I say this all the time, but I am preaching to me. I don't care if you get anything out of this sermon. I am preaching to me. It, it should be on my tombstone, except I'm probably going to get cremated. But, but one way or the other, I'm just telling you, it's not deep enough in my life. And it's probably not deep enough in your life either. David is writing this at the end of his life, later on in life. David, who started out as the obscure youngest child in a family full of notable sons, 
When the prophet came to anoint the next king, he came to the house of Jesse and all the sons that were there weren't good enough. They went and found him out in the field as a shepherd. Okay, that's where he ended up starting from. Then he slays Goliath, which makes him one of the most popular human beings on, in, the, in the community, right? He's like Bieber back in the day on YouTube. Boom, you know, zero to hero, which leads, us to, which leads him to be a, a really problem in the face of a jealous king, King Saul. And then David goes from being the, you know, this guy that everybody's loving to being in this running lifestyle where he's running from his life for his life. He's running from the authorities. He's hiding out in caves. He actually at one point acted like he was insane so that he could keep from being killed. Then the king is gone. Finally, he becomes king and is a great king, but he's got a few problems. His son tries to take the throne. There's that whole Bathsheba debacle. Greatest king of Israel, but it was not an easy, good, wonderful life. So it's at the end, okay? It's at the end when he writes Psalm 23. It's through, if you will, the lenses of both his good and bad experiences that he confidently reminds us of what is important. And I want you to understand that because even though it's 2020 and what they're calling, you know, that stupid word nobody wants to hear again, unprecedented times, it may be unprecedented for us, but it's not unprecedented, you guys, for humanity. Sheep have had struggles before. So how do we survive? Actually, the two, first two words of this psalm are everything, all right? The Lord. The Lord. It should be capitalized in your Bible if you're following along on your phone app. L-O-R-D. The reason why it's in all caps is not because it's your mom and she's trying to message you on Facebook and she doesn't realize her caps lock is on. It's because it's important, okay? It's because whenever the word Lord is written in Scripture, it's a referral back to the Hebrew word for God, Yahweh, that is the most important, the highest description the Hebrew language would have for their concept of God. It is the definition of the Almighty God, the self-sufficient one, the one who is omniscient and omnipresent, if you understand those words, and is eternal. It is the divine name for the, for, for the God of everything, okay? And here's what I love. That is where David starts. Think about this, okay? I love that David doesn't start with his laundry list of things, that are wrong or things that he's been through or whatever situation he's writing in at, at this moment, his entire focal point starts with the Lord. And that's the wisdom of the greatest of all time. You see, if I were writing this, I won't even say you, if I were writing this, I would be tempted to say, dear God, it's 2020. Low key 2020. Dear God, there's a pandemic. I'm so tired of wearing masks. I don't know what's going to happen. Our nation is divided. Our economy is teetering on the edge. We're going to set a record for tropical storms this year, and neither the Sox nor the Cubs made it past the first round of the playoffs. God, that's where I would want to start, right? But you see, we have two choices in 2020 we can focus on our needs or we can focus on our shepherd. And for David, he's saying, God, the Lord, the most high being, powerful thing in the universe is my shepherd. Again, David had been a shepherd. He was very familiar with this. So when he writes this, he's saying, the Lord in all of his glory and all of his power and all of his understanding is concerned about me, is my shepherd. It's a relationship that's way beneath the glory of the Lord. So maybe the first question you ought to ask yourself today is how do I see God? If you're watching this online, you're watching from the UK, we got people in Africa, people in Australia, you're at your living room in the US, you're at your desk, wherever you are, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself this question. Start here. How do I see God? And I'll give you some choices. Is he an impersonal cosmic force, like a lot of religions believe? I mean, maybe you do believe that God is real and, and, and you believe that he exists, but there's no way that you could wrap your brain around the idea that he would actually want to know you because he's so up there, right? 
You can't imagine he'd want to have a relationship with you and care about the things that you're going through individually. That just doesn't make any sense. You can't, you, you, you imagine all of humanity right now. Imagine what God's prayer line is like right now, right? I mean, problem, there's more people than ever and there's more prayer needs than ever. So you're thinking, God can't possibly hear me over all that stuff. He can't possibly care about me over all that stuff. What, what David and I and Jesus and every Bible writer would like to tell you is that yes, Yes, he does. He is your shepherd. He's not an impersonal cosmic force. He's not an angry lightning bolt thrower either. I really don't get why some people follow religions with an angry God, and yet most do. It's not something that those religions put on their sign out front, you know, come follow our God, he wants to smite you, all are welcome. They don't do that, but that's what you find out when you dig in there. That's the truth. In most of the other kinds of religions, you better shape up or you're going to be shipped out. I don't know why. I was thinking about this recently, and, and at this point in my life, I would just not do it. I, I just would be like, forget it. I'll take my chances. I would rather be an atheist than, than belong to a religion that depended on me measuring up to an angry God's idea of who I ought to be. How about a disappointed parent? How do you see God? Do you see him that way? You know, no matter what you do, whatever you achieve, you get a B, you should have had an A, you get a C, you should have had a B. No matter what you're going to try, you know, what you try to accomplish, God's never really going to be satisfied with me because I'm not that great. You know, you look around at other people and they're better people than me. I'm no Mother Teresa, right? Is that your view of God? How about absent father? So many times we experience God through the lens of our own relationship with our own family and with our own disappointments in our life. And maybe somebody wasn't who we hoped and they weren't there for us. And we take our human perspective and we lay it over the divine view of God. And sometimes it can ruin God for all that God really is, our Father who art in heaven. He's not an absent father. The Bible says he's with us. The Bible says he knows us. He loves us. He will never leave us or forsake us. That's what it says. That's why I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. How you view God is the most important thing about you because it will affect everything. How can the Lord be your shepherd if he's one of those faulty views of God? And many times we think of God in the awe-inspiring terms, you know, that he, he's all that, that, he, that, he, that he's all-sufficient, that he, that he can see all and do all and be all. But when life is hard, I'm not sure that's the most important thing for us to remember. Those are all true. But I think the most important thing to remember is shepherd. Shepherd communicates a level of intimacy that God has with people. Yahweh is my shepherd. Now we're getting to it, aren't we? My. See, the temptation in ancient Israel was to speak about our God, you know, as a collective nation thing. Um, but, but, but we got to talk about the individual thing. And the beauty of this psalm is in the personal expression of that reverence. Dallas Willard said it this way. He said, for, the, for this reason, Psalm 23 is such a popular psalm because it permits each believer to take its words on his or her lips and express in gratitude and confidence that all the demonstrations of God's covenant love are his too. God spent a lot of time talking about how much he loved the nation of Israel. What Psalm 23 does for us, Willard says, is it, it lets it be personal to us. That, that unconditional covenant love, no matter what you do, I'm going to love you, is my shepherd. The Bible says, Jesus said, the sheep listen to the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them. Man, is that, is that even possible? that we hear him. I was talking to a friend this week whose life was literally, literally transformed by the experience of going camping in a place where they didn't have any cell coverage. 
I mean, it, it, it blew him away. It transformed his life. And it wasn't that he was reading the Bible all day, every day. He wasn't spending his time singing hymns or chanting the Lord's Prayer over and over again. He didn't do anything spiritual except lose his cell phone connection, okay? Guys, if you haven't watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, I'm begging you to do it. This tiny little technological miracle is ruining our lives. How can the Lord be your shepherd and you won't want if you can't hear him? I mean, you've probably had pastors tell you that it would be very spiritual for you to spend a bunch of time praying or reading your Bible. And I hope that you know that that's true. But I'm telling you that in 2020, the most spiritual thing you might do today is just turn off your stupid technology so you can hear the shepherd. The sheep that belong to Jesus hear his voice and follow wherever he leads. But there are so many other voices. In our small group lesson material this week, Matt Chandler specifically mentions three examples, our personal desires, our culture, and our relationships. I hope you'll jump into a group, parkviewchurch.com slash Psalm 23. We'd love to get you involved in it. Here's what Jesus said, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. All the other shepherds that you're trying to listen to, they're, they're thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Are you experiencing a full life right now? Or are the other shepherds yelling a little bit too loudly? <laughs> <laughs> My father-in-law's listening to this. Hi, Don. He's 86. He's a little hard of hearing. So when he's with us, staying with us, he likes his news on and he likes it really loud. Literally, the news anchor is the loudest shepherd with the worst news ever. Shut it off, okay? Shut it off. Get rid of it. And listen to the shepherd who brings you life. Sunday school teacher was asking little kids one day if anybody could quote the 23rd Psalm, and a little five-year-old girl raised her hand. And the teacher was a little skeptical, but she's like, okay, go ahead. And the little girl stood up and in front of the other kids and very, very proudly said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. And then she sat down. Nailed it. In John 10, Jesus goes on and says of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. What Jesus is saying is, hey, I'm not a temporary savior. I'm not a temporary shepherd. I'm not a temporary solution for you like everything else they're telling you is. In this culture, back then, it would have been very common for a shepherd to hire some help, right? And, and, and the problem was when that hired help faced danger, maybe a wolf or a bear like David did when he was a shepherd, or, or a situation that would cause danger to the flock, he's a hired hand, they're not his sheep, he's out of here. He doesn't have a personal investment in the flock like the shepherd did. Listen, you can measure the, the worth of anything by the price somebody is willing to pay for it. And this shepherd, in this illustration, would have paid personally for every single one of his sheep that he calls his own flock. And we know that Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and me when he gave his own life on a cross. If you ever wonder what the value of your life is, if you ever wrestle with your own self-worth, I promise you, your self-worth is not in yourself. It's not in what you think of yourself. It's not in what you do yourself. The value of your life is summarized. The sum total is what somebody is willing to pay for it. And Jesus paid everything for it. And maybe you are listening to me wherever you are and you're just not sure where you're at with Jesus. I want to invite you, just text I said yes to 708-295-3729 and we will help you. We will encourage you. Just open up your heart to Jesus right now.
I'd love for you to memorize this psalm if you haven't already in your life, but I really want you to practice it, okay? So, 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 so that's the important thing. Just don't let it be you. Don't let you be the person who knows the words. I, I want this to be something that really works in your life. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Every day when you get up, every chance you get to think about it, I want you to have this, and I'll tweet it out this week too so you remember. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not blank about blank. Okay? Obviously, I shall not want, but what does that look like? And usually it's like, I will not worry about my job. I will not, you know, be angry with my family. I will whatever, though, because the Lord is my shepherd. Fill in the blanks right there. And I want you to know the shepherd and rest in the arms of the presence of the shepherd this week. And we're going to unpack it. Here's your hook. You want to know what kind of sheep lie down in green pastures? Stupid sheep, thank you. Yes, right. No, not, not even as dumb as they are, there's only one way that sheep lie down in green pastures, and I'm not going to tell you about it until next week. There was a story of a famous actor who was at an event, and it was a social gathering, and he's just one of those oratory kind of guys, a stage actor, and people were standing around asking him to recite different famous passages, and he was doing it. And there was an old preacher in that gathering that day, and the preacher said, please, sir, would you recite the 23rd Psalm? And the actor said, well, I will if you will. And the pastor agreed. So the actor stood up and began to recite the 23rd Psalm in the way you would think an actor would do it. Very fancy actor voice, you know, rising and falling and all the dramatic elements. And, and it was just very beautiful and elegant. The Lord is my shepherd. And when, every, when he was done, everybody applauded. It was amazing. And they said, okay, it's your turn. The, the old preacher got up and his voice was cracking and he didn't have really any eloquence at all, but he spoke as if it was a prayer. And it came right out of the depths of his soul. The Lord is my shepherd. And when he was done, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. Someone asked later, what was the difference between those two? To which somebody else wisely said, well, the actor knew the psalm, but the pastor knew the shepherd. That's what we want for you. Dear God, 2020 needs this psalm. I need this psalm. I need you to be my shepherd. And for the people listening, I pray that this will be a day when they say, hey, you know what? I'm going to stop listening to all the other dumb shepherds. And I'm only going to listen to you. And it's going to start with the Lord, the Yahweh, the God of the universe is my personal shepherd, cares for me, loves me, died for me. Seems like everything else that flows out of that should be okay. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. This is going to be an amazing teaching series. And like I hinted at earlier, there's an opportunity for you, Parkview's online community, to dive a little deeper into Psalm 23 by studying that section of the Bible with some other people. It's called a short-term group study, and we call it that because you'll be studying the Bible with a group, and it only lasts a few weeks. And the really cool thing is that you can do it completely online. So if that's something you're interested in, go to parkvchurch.com slash Psalm 23 to find more information and even to get signed up. Uh, before we close our time together, uh, the band is going to lead us in another song, and I hope this is a reminder to you you, that God is faithful whether it's on the hills or through the valleys of life. Enjoy.
Thanks again for joining us for another Parkview at Home experience. Uh, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. See you next time. Just like